So uh, conventional generate uh, agonist protocol presents several advantages. And these advantages uh, are that uh, this protocol is a standard uh, protocol since uh, more than uh, 20 years. Uh, the, when the introduction of this protocol, the cancellation rate due to premature utilization dropped to, um, uh, from 30% to less than 2%. Uh, with this protocol, it is very possibly to uh, schedule the program in an IVF center. And with this protocol, it is possible to increase the number of sites retrieved and, uh, and therefore there's a significant increase compared to the previous protocols, the uh, cumulative pregnancy rates. And uh, amongst the different protocols that um, use the generate agonist, the uh, long protocols that represent more than 70% of uh, uh, the uh, protocols. However, uh, GNRA agonist protocol have some uh, uh, disadvantages, and these advantages are that uh, uh, they need a long pretreatment period until uh, desensitization occur. Uh, there's a higher cost uh, due to an increased use of uh, gonadotropins. Uh, is uh, especially in good responder patients is very likely to have more than uh, 20 oral sites, and so to expose to these patients to an important risk of ovarian hyperstimulation. And there's no the possibility to avoid ovarian hyperstimulation in case of patients with high risk. And this is the crucial point that we are going to discuss in uh, this lecture and in the other lecture next. So uh, with the, uh, so with, uh, uh, with the uh, pass of the year, uh, we try to, um, to assess uh, a protocol that uh, could uh, reduce the discomfort for the patients, that could reduce the risks, that uh, uh, could reduce the cost. And therefore, these protocols we, we called uh, milder protocols. But to, to use this milder protocol, we have to use the generage antagonist. So with the use of generage antagonist protocol, there's a reduced patient's burden and the psychological stress and so this makes the protocols more, no more patient friendly. Uh, there's a short duration, less amount of drugs, so there are reduced costs. Uh, it doesn't work very well, this, this stuff here. I go with this. Sorry. Uh, this, there's a, a possibility, the strategy to erase ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, to completely erase ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome and uh, uh, similar pregnancy rates with meta-analysis. And then we, were, we are going to analyze why at the beginning there was a significantly reduced uh, chance to have a pregnancy using this approach. Uh, all we know that uh, uh, for our patients, uh, the stimulation protocols have um, comport uh, uh, limited everyday activities. They are very stressful. Uh, there are burden for with regard to the emotional effects, and uh, they involve uh, many people around of them. So it's a very stressful condition during 15, 20, 25 days uh, during the uh, controlled ovarian hyperstimulation. And when we look at the <coughs> at the reason for um, uh, dropout uh, in our uh, centers. Then we see that the physical and, physio and uh, uh, psychological burden of treatment is the most important reason for dropout. And we all know that the higher is the dropout, the lower is the cumulative pregnancy rate. If the patients do not drop out, then at the end we will, have, uh, we will end up in uh, more pregnancies. Um, uh, the, uh, another important point is the uh, reduced uh, amount of uh, days of stimulation, the reduced amount of drugs and the reduced costs, especially in these moments of crisis. So in this uh, paper by Polymer in 2008, uh, there was a significantly lower cost with uh, using milder stimulation protocols compared to the standard protocol. And 40, 50% of these costs are due to the, medic to the medication. And uh, uh, of course, with the milder stimulation protocols, there's a significantly reduced amount of medications used. And uh, also in our analysis that we did uh, 
uh, back in a uh, few years ago, we observed that using the antagonist uh, protocol, the international units of gonotrophins per clinical pregnancy were significantly lower, and also the amount of money to spend for uh, medication was significantly lower in, uh, uh, in the uh, antagonist protocol. And this difference was uh, 431 uh, euros per pregnancy, and this means that uh, the mean cost saving of that amount of money per clinical pregnancy allows one additional pregnancy every 6.5 uh, um, uh, pregnancy. But I believe that, and then Paul will, uh, will, uh, will lecture afterwards in a couple of, uh, in within one hour, I, I believe that uh, uh, it's not anymore acceptable to have uh, uh, ovarian, severe ovarian hyperstimulations. And uh, today, we have the possibility to almost eradicate uh, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome using uh, uh, the uh, ovarian hyperstimulation approach. So the antagonist uh, protocol per se uh, reduced significantly the chance of uh, controlled ovarian, uh, of, uh, uh, um, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, severe ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. But the, uh, and this is the, uh, the meta-analysis uh, on uh, this respect, but the important point is that the use of the generation antagonist uh, permits to uh, trigger the final ov ov ovarian maturation using a bolus of generation agonist, so inducing the uh, spontaneous LH, LH peak. And uh, the, the uh, different half-life of LH, which is 60 minutes, uh, versus uh, more than 24 hours uh, um, almost eradicates the risk of inducing the cascade of events that uh, lead to the uh, um, severe ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, at least in the, uh, the, with the early onset. Uh, and this is what uh, is recently reported uh, as a meta-analysis in um, in um, human reproduction update, and you see that according to these randomized controlled trials, the risk of uh, uh, in a donor in a donor uh, stimulation, uh, the risk of uh, severe uh, hyperstimulation in the uh, agonist triggering arm was was zero percent compared to this uh, um, chance of uh, uh, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome in the ACG triggering arm. But the important point is that very soon we realize that when we use this approach, the uh, chance of having a pregnancy with a standard luteal, luteal phase support were significantly decreased. So uh, uh, what has been proposed is different luteal phase support approaches, but so far the most optimal luteal phase support has to be uh, uh, determined. And uh, mm, uh, uh, one, uh, uh, one strategy, and uh, is uh, indeed the strategies that we use, is to, in these cases, to uh, freeze everything, all site or embryos or, or, or both of them, and then transfer on the subsequent cycle. <coughs> so uh, it was claimed that uh, uh, these protocols leads to a lower pregnancy rate, but there's a, this very uh, recent meta-analysis that uh, demonstrate that uh, the, um, uh, on 7,511 um, uh, cycles that demonstrates that the chance of uh, having a live birth is absolutely uh, comparable. And uh, <coughs> at the beginning, at the beginning there was a, a, a report in 2001 that uh, the uh, pregnancy rate was significantly reduced of 5%. But this was due to the fact that uh, the, uh, these protocols were used as a second line um, protocols. And uh, in uh, this paper by Griesinger uh, from the IVF German Registry from 2002, 2000-2003, uh, it was clearly demonstrated that the use of GnRH antagonists was for mainly for patients at poor prognosis or those patients that failed or th those patients uh, of uh, o uh, older age. And you can see, in fact, here that in a good prognosis patients, uh, the difference uh, uh, was significant uh, when uh, uh, in most of them was used the long protocol and in a small proportion of them was used the antagonist protocol. So, <coughs> 
Andrea asked me to look to our database and then to uh, see uh, in a good prognosis patients what's happened with the uh, mm, using uh, the uh, agonist protocol or the antagonist protocol. So this is our database from January 2011, August 2012. Uh, the dramatic uh, first thing to uh, comment on is a uh, uh, mean age of 38.2 years. And uh, um, almost 500 were antagonist uh, protocol, almost 400 long protocol, almost 400 spontaneous cycle, and uh, more than 500 uh, flare up. Let me, let me tell you that uh, spontaneous cycles, uh, we use spontaneous cycles for those patients that uh, uh, they are not yet convinced to go for um, outside donation, and then they want to try uh, to, uh, to have um, uh, the last chance of having a pregnancy, and uh, the, we use the flare up immediately uh, before this, uh, this stage. So, <coughs> If we look at this, uh, these two different categories of patients, it's more than 50%. So uh, this is very frustrating because more than 50% of our patients are really very poor prognosis patients. And uh, uh, when we analyzed the, uh, the uh, patients that underwent treatment with generation antagonists or long, then uh, uh, we, uh, we, we, we take out from this, uh, uh, from this uh, uh, series the PGD cycles, and then uh, women for, with an age more than 40, baseline of FSH more than 11, and more than two IVF cycles performed. So what <coughs> we obtained, is uh, mm, 279 and 269 uh, patients, which represent 30%. So this means that uh, uh, one out of three patients that we uh, routinely treat is in bracket a better prognosis uh, uh, patients. Um, when we look at the uh, fresh cycles, patients characteristics, then <coughs> we see that uh, uh, there's a, a zero, a seven months of difference in uh, in, uh, uh, in the age, being the patients of generation antagonists uh, uh, significantly older. And this is due, I will show you in the next slides, because in the, in the group of patients between 35 and 40, uh, normally we use the generation agonist, antago ag antagonist uh, protocols in those patients that have a little bit lower number of follicles at the antral follicle count. And uh, uh, the previous, and this is of course is a bias of this analysis, and then we have to take into account this, uh, this point here. And uh, <coughs> the previous IVF cycles performed was comparable, the baseline FSH of was comparable, the uh, gonadotrophins use was significantly lower, the number of stimulation days was lower, the mean number of side retrieve was, was lower, and the metaphase 2 or site was of course lower. When we look at the laboratory characteristics, uh, <coughs> then the inseminated oocyte was significantly lower, and therefore were significantly lower the mean number of two PNs to the two, the, 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 the mean number of vitrified oocytes, obtained embryos, top quality embryos, and so on. And but what is uh, uh, from a clinical viewpoint, I believe is important, is that with the antagonist, we have a significantly reduced number of cycles uh, that uh, have uh, uh, something cryopreserve, oocyte or embryos. Um, so uh, we divided the, uh, the cycle according to the age, less than or equal than 35. And uh, in this group of patients, um, we have a um, we had a significantly reduced number of uh, embryo transfer performed because mainly in this group of patients, there are patients of higher risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. And in this group of patients, uh, we uh, prefer to use the antagonist and, uh, <coughs> and, uh, and uh, we freeze uh, all the embryos in this group of patients. Uh, the mean number of embryo transfer was, was uh, 0.1 embryos mean transferred, uh, which was significant. And then the clinical pregnancy rate per cycle was 33 and 41. Per embryo transfer was absolutely comparable. The implantation rate was absolutely comparable. The abortion rate as also. And the ongoing, ongoing means behind, be, behind the 12 weeks of gestation 
the Rembro transfer was comparable and also the ongoing implantation was absolutely comparable. When we look at the, uh, at the age more than 35 in the older patients, then as I told you before, there was a significantly higher proportion of patients that uh, we use the antagonist uh, and uh, uh, compared in and uh, um, protocol compared to the long protocol. Then the, uh, the clinical pregnancy rate per cycle was uh, 25 and 35. Uh, the, 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 the small numbers did not uh, low to reach the statistical significance, but the difference is it was here. The clinical pregnancy rate per embryo transfer was 30.5 uh, mm, and 40.3. The implantation rate was comparable and was uh, comparable also the ongoing implantation rate. This means that uh, the embryos that we, in this group of patients that we obtained, the mm, potential evolution of this embryo absolutely was comparable in the two groups. But as you remember before, the, uh, uh, in the antagonist uh, uh, group, there was a significantly lower um, number of cycles that have uh, oocyte or embryo cryo preserved. So when we look at the cumulative ongoing pregnancy rate, then uh, we see that uh, the um, that in uh, the sorry that in the younger group uh, there was the result was absolutely uh, mm, comparable, not significant difference. In the uh, older group. Uh, there was a, um, a significant uh, uh, reduction of uh, the, uh, the uh, clinical ongoing pregnancy, the ongoing pregnancy rate. And when we uh, add all together uh, the cumulative results, then we see that uh, with the antagonist group, we have 32% ongoing behind the, beyond the 12 weeks of gestation and 48.1, which was significant different. Of course, we have to keep in mind the, uh, the bias of, uh, of uh, the, the age. This is not a prospective randomized trial. And uh, so therefore, in uh, um, uh, the most important um, aspect of uh, the using of this protocol is the possibility to reduce the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation. And uh, uh, the patients were at risk uh, the cancellation that canceled the cycles, a risk of ovarian hyperstimulation was in the antagonist uh, 13 and in the long protocol was 8.9. No embryo available uh, was significantly higher in the antagonist group. Different reasons was comparable. And uh, so the total cycles that canceled that did not do the, um, the fresh uh, embryo transfer was 19 versus 13. <coughs> But uh, what is important is that uh, uh, with the antagonists, we did not have one in this half a year period, we did not have one single uh, patient that uh, had severe hyperstimulation syndrome that need hospital ad admission and in the long protocol. Although, <coughs> although all uh, the measure adopted to try to reduce the risk, we had 2.6% chance of uh, patients went to the hospital mission for um, uh, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. And uh, so uh, let, let me say that with the GnRH antagonist protocol, we are very close to free OHSS clinics like Paul will uh, talk about later. So let me conclude saying that this is a retrospective study. And there's a higher proportion of the use of uh, the GnRH antagonist in patients more than 35, and this is uh, unfortunately, is a bias of this uh, of this study. There's a significantly lower number of days of stimulation, higher amount of gonotrophins used, and this is good. Lower number of side retrieves and metaphase two oocyte. This is quasi bad in the GnRH antagonist protocol group if we consider the cumulative uh, pregnancy rate. The significantly higher proportion of cycles with vitrified oocyte and or embryos in the long GnRH antagonist protocol group. And uh, there's a comparable ongoing more than 12 weeks of gestation pregnancy per embryo transfer and implantation rates. There's a significantly higher cumulative ongoing pregnancy rates in the group of GnRH Jaguars protocol when cryopreserved all site and embryos were used. But as far as I know, there are not very robust evidences on the, on the cumulative rate in the, in the literature. So 
prospective randomized trials are very much needed. And there's significantly lower incidence of HS of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome in the GnRH antagonist versus agonist group. And we are very close to HSS free clinic. Thank you for your attention.